All right then. Hey everybody. Um, so, uh, some of you know me. My name is Alex Taylor. Uh, I'm currently a contractor with uh, Arkanoi. Today, I'm going to be talking about two topics related to the output and display of text, namely printing and fonts under OS2. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, this is a quick outline of what I'll be covering. Uh, this is mostly useful if you're going to be downloading the slides later. So uh, can we go straight on to the next slide, please? So until the paperless office finally arrives, uh, printing is going to be an essential part of information management. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we in particular have struggled with printing for quite a while now, since vendors don't provide native OS2 printer drivers anymore. Next slide, please. So, uh, an overview of how printing works. Uh, how can we get a particular model of printer to work under OS2? Well, there are three basic approaches. Uh, first method, and the oldest one, obviously, is to use so-called native printing. Uh, you install a presentation manager driver for the printer or a compatible model. Uh, you create a printer object for it, which points directly to that printer. And this was how printing worked for years. But the problem with this mo uh, approach is that it doesn't do a great job of supporting recent printer models since we don't have those native drivers. Sometimes uh, we can find a driver for an older model which does work, uh, but that's not guaranteed, and even then, not all your printer's features may be supported. It does, in theory, work well if you've got a native PostScript printer, because in that case it's possible to create, as it were, uh, a native driver by importing a manufacturer-supplied PPD file. But in recent years, even that's become a bit problematic because a lot of modern PostScript printers have PPDs which are just too big or too weird for our driver to handle without crashing. We actually uh, are working on a solution for that, uh, which I'll discuss more a bit, li a bit later on. And of course, for entry-level printers, maybe under 100 euros, uh, or anything which is a GDI printer, which is what they call a host-based printer, aka win printer, um, you're, you're pretty much guaranteed to be out of luck. This, uh, n you'll never find a native driver that works for it, barring a miracle. Now, uh, what you can sometimes do is cheat a bit by using GhostScript. Uh, GhostScript is an open source PostScript emulator that happens to contain a number of built-in printer drivers, including some for printers which aren't supported in any other way. Um, actually, this is especially common for Japanese printers, like some models of Epson laser printer. However, doing this requires some technical know-how to set up. Uh, the procedure is actually documented on the NetLegs eCups wiki, if you're really morbidly curious. Uh, but it also only works with a relatively small number of printers. And lastly, of course, we have cups. Uh, in many respects, cups represents the future of printing on OS2, at least for non-native PostScript printers. Cups supports a vast number of printers, old and new. However, Cups requires the installation of some very large software packages and is notoriously complicated to configure. And it can also be hard to troubleshoot if something goes wrong. Next slide, please. As you may know, Cups is the common Unix printing system. The name is a bit misleading because it's also the standard printing system on Mac OS X, uh, as well as Linux and various other Unix derivatives. Uh, the basic CUPS framework is open source, as are most of the common driver suites. And these have been ported to OS2, mainly by Paul Smedley. However, some vendors on Linux and Mac uh, provide CUPS support 
through closed source binary drivers, and these of course cannot be ported. So that's a, something we do sometimes have to be aware of. Now, besides the fact that it supports so many printers, the biggest advantage of CUPS is that it is actively developed and maintained with a full open source community and major commercial backing uh, behind it. Uh, it's owned by Apple, actually. You can install CUPS in a couple of different ways. Uh, now, Paul generally releases builds in zip format, some of which have fairly complicated dependencies. Stable releases usually can be found either on his website or at the NetLabs eCup site, which is shown on the slide. Uh, more bleeding edge releases are usually posted in the eCup's Gmain group uh, slash mailing list. That's gmain.org.netlabs.ecups.devel, if, if anybody doesn't know that. And also, uh, for the past few years, I've been releasing Warpin installers for CUPS. Um, I uploaded the latest stable version, actually, 2.0.10, to NetLabs uh, a month or so ago. Unfortunately, I found that each new release of CUPS has more and more complicated dependencies and installation requirements, and it is really stretching the ability of Warpin to be able to manage that and it's also stretching my sanity in trying to maintain it. Therefore, uh, 2010 will probably be the last warping installer for CUPS. The good news, however, is that future versions uh, are to be available, are going to be available via YUM and RPM. And for people who don't use YUM and can't bear to try it, uh, zip files should still be available for manual distribution, at least for the time being. Next slide, please. Now, um, getting printing going with CUPS, uh, you need to create a working printer object, and that is a complicated multi-step procedure, and it's easy to get things wrong. So. Uh, that's one reason that I wrote the CUPS wizard, which is a simple and relatively easy GUI for creating CUPS printers on OS2. And CUPS wizard is available from my website as well as uh, from NetLabs, and it's included in the Warpin installers that I mentioned. Uh, there's a screenshot here, but uh, I don't have time to give you a demo of it. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay then, PM printer manager. This is another GUI which I wrote to try and simplify printer management. Uh, this is an app which combines the functionality of several older tools, many of which I also wrote. And it's intended to be a sort of one-stop shop for managing your printers. Although I admit it's maybe not a hundred percent of the way there yet. Actually, my original idea was to create a subclass of the printer's folder in the workplace shell, which could implement this functionality through a workplace shell class. However, I have no knowledge of workplace shell programming, and I... So I did it as an application instead. Now, PM Printer Manager still doesn't fully integrate CUPS printer management, so you may still need to use the CUPS web GUI for some things, like setting job options. Um, for creating CUPS printers, you can do it through PM Printer Manager, but currently it just runs the CUPS wizard, uh, calls it. Uh, I may incorporate this functionality properly later. Um, there are still a few things that don't work as smoothly as I'd like. Uh, it doesn't always refresh the uh, display properly. Uh, that's something else I'm going to look at. But uh, this is a work in progress. But as I say, right now it's pretty usable already. And again, it's available from my website. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, now I'm going to talk about PS Print briefly. Um, now the normal PostScript printer driver in OS2 is called pscript.drv. Uh, CUPS also actually uses a modified version of that called ecups.drv. And psprint is another modified version that I started working on a few years ago. Uh, it's based on the sources of pscript from the IBM DDK. And it includes all of the fixes 
I want to emphasize that, by the way, fixes, not certain other logic, but includes all of the, the actual bug fixes that ecups.drv has, but it also fixes a couple of other bugs as well. And of course, every now and then I discover a few more bugs that need to be fixed. However, its marquee feature is to support true type font embedding. And if you don't know what font embedding is, uh, basically, this allows fonts that you use in a document that you're printing, it allows the actual fonts to be embedded in the print job. And this allows the text to be rendered properly in the printout as text, rather than being simulated through bitmaps. Now, the original PostScript driver from IBM, PScript, only allowed embedding of PostScript Type 1 fonts. The thing about PS Print is that it lets true type fonts be embedded as well. And let's face it, the majority of fonts nowadays are those TTF or, or OTF, but that's a separate story. Um, not many people really use po um, Type 1 fonts anymore, so this is one reason uh, that I thought this was useful. Now, doing this, embedding the fonts, generally makes the printed text look better. And it kind of depends on the job, but it can often result in a smaller print job as well, which in turn may lead to faster queuing, spooling, and printing. And as a bonus, if you use a printer object to generate PDF files, such as through ePDF or PMPDF, uh, it provides the same benefit in the PDF. In other words, the PDF actually contains the text and not a bitmap of the text, which allows things like text searching to work. Next slide, please. PS Print is pretty stable for most uses. It's still under development, uh, of course, and it isn't perfect yet. Uh, there are still a few bugs that I'm aware of, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. But uh, recently, some special development efforts have been launched to fix some long-term issues related to using PIN to import PPD files. And these are issues with all of the PostScript drivers, PScript, ECOPS, PSPrint. And actually, uh, Jan van Wyk has been doing a lot of work on this. Uh, and he's made a lot of progress so far. Now, the problems that we were having with PIN, uh, as mentioned, a number of modern printers supply PPDs which can't be imported successfully. In the simplest case, this simply causes PIN to fail by crashing when you try to import the PPD. More, de um, more dangerously, uh, in other cases, PIN may appear to work and the driver actually reports as available and installed, but when you actually try to print something, your application may crash or something else weird might happen because even though the driver seems to have imported the data, what it actually imported is just corrupt in strange ways. So these are the issues that we've been trying to fix, and we've made a lot of progress at fixing them, I'm happy to say. I'm hoping that uh, uh, a new release which uh, provides these fixes can be made public fairly soon. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, as I said, PS Print isn't uh, perfect yet. We're still testing the various PPD issues, although it does look promising so far, as I've said. Now, here are some other known issues with PS Print, and I don't necessarily have a timeline on fixing all of these. Uh, first of all, it may still be necessary to clean your PPD files, especially ones that are for use with CUPS, uh, before you import them. Now, if you use PM Printer Manager or CUPSWiz, uh, it will try to do this automatically. But if you use pin from the command line, you might have to run, uh, there's a script floating around called clean PPD. It's available on the ECUP site. Um, you may have to run the PPD through that before you can get it to uh, import successfully. Uh, another problem, in the past, some people have reported problems with printing equations in Lotus Word Pro. And this is caused by the wrong um, scaling units being used, so when it tries to draw the equation, it uses a special coordinate system and it ends up either drawing them at microscopic size or such a huge space that it, it ends up off the page or something. At any rate, I've poked at this problem a bit, but since I can't, I don't use Lotus myself, in fact I don't think I have it installed in any of my computers these days, so I can't tell whether it's still an issue or not. And if anybody has Lotus Word Pro and knows how to produce this problem, um, 
I'd certainly be happy if you could tell me whether this still really does happen with the latest version. Um, once the latest version is released. Uh, another one. Uh, I recently found out about this one, actually. If you print an ASCII text file in plain text mode with word wrap turned on in the printer properties and you have a true type font selected, you will get a corrupted printout. The text will be mashed together or running over itself and so on. Um, so that's definitely a, a bug that is probably my fault, so I'm going to have to figure out what's happening there. I haven't had a chance yet, but I hope I'll get to it soon. Um, finally, uh, if you print from Lucid, the uh, venerable PDF viewer, uh, and you use PostScript mode to print, this may not work on some printers. I think it usually works on cu in, or with cups, but if you have a native PostScript printer, it may or may not work. And this is due to a combination of how Lucid generates print jobs uh, with one of the logic paths in the driver. Uh, basically, the job gets sent to the printer without a valid PostScript header. And some printers are OK with this and will print just fine. Others may not do anything, and some may start spitting out garbage. So if this happens to you, uh, you can try printing in image mode instead, which is one of the options that Lucid offers you, although the print quality is a bit lower. Next slide, please. Moving on now. Um, PDF files are a common way of exchanging uh, print formatted documents. People often need to work with them. I'll briefly talk about the two most basic tasks, creating PDFs and printing them. To create PDFs, there are a number of software tools for OS2, in particular PMPDF and ePDF. These both work in basically the same way. You create a printer object that uses some generic or fairly generic PostScript printer driver, but instead of using a standard printer port, you print to a special filter that's set up by the tool. And this filter takes the raw PostScript file that's generated by the driver and runs it through GhostScript, which is the program I mentioned earlier, which converts it into a PDF. Uh, both of these programs, PMPDF and ePDF, are free, and they're both fairly easy to use and set up. Uh, of course, you can always do this manually on your own if you're comfortable with it. Just use a PostScript driver to print a file. And then you end up with a PostScript file, and you can use GhostScript or its GUI GSView to convert that PostScript file to a PDF yourself. It's a bit of an extra step, but it's not that hard. Um, now, Firefox and SeaMonkey also have the ability to generate PDFs. And this, this is rather nice, actually. When you use the print to file option from Firefox, if you specify an output file name which has the extension PDF, it will automatically generate a PDF for you. Uh, same with SeaMonkey. I'm not sure if uh, Thunderbird does the same thing, but quite likely. Uh, and of course, OpenOffice has an option to export to PDF as well, uh, although in my experience you need at least version 3 of OpenOffice for this to work properly. So moving on to printing PDFs, uh, it's pretty simple. If you have a recent version of CUPS, for one, for one thing, you should be able to just dump the PDF to the printer queue, since CUPS can automatically handle PDF files natively. Um, and you can also print PDFs using GSView, which is the free GUI for GhostScript, which I mentioned although the interface, I admit, is a bit awkward. And, of course, a good PDF viewer can print PDFs. QPDF is one, although QPDF requires that you have CUPS installed. It cannot print to a non-CUPS printer. The other main one is Lucid, which some of us still use, some of us still like, sorry, Sylvan, and which uh, I believe Arkanoe is planning to try and resume development of. Watch this space, I guess. So that's basically printing. Uh, let's move on to the next one. The next slide, please. OK, so now uh, from this point, I'm going to move on to my second topic, which is using fonts on OS2. And I will freely admit I'm a bit of a, a font geek. So um, yeah, this is, this is the fun part for me. Next slide, please. So um, let's talk about desktop fonts, that is fonts on your desktop. 
Large monitors with high resolutions are becoming more widespread. Look at Apple's Retina displays, for example. Unfortunately, it's hard for OS2 users to take advantage of this because even if our video driver supports, I don't know, 3000 by 1800 resolution, uh, we still have fixed size icons, although, as Lewis said, there, we might be able to address that. Um, but we also have relatively small default desktop fonts. So what do we do about the fonts? Obviously, we can change the default desktop fonts for most things. If we want to make them larger or use a different font, whatever, uh, we can do that through the scheme palette. Unfortunately, there are two major things that we can't change using the scheme palette. And those are the default dialog font and the font used in Workplace Shell property notebooks. There are a couple of ways to change the default dialog font. You can't use the scheme palette to do it. Well, but OS2 has a built-in mechanism that can be set using a special key that exists, or that you can add, rather, to OS2.ini under PM underscore system fonts. Now, only DBCS versions of OS2 actually provide a UI for this in the workplace shell itself. Uh, however, some third-party video drivers and a few other utilities also provide a GUI that lets you do this simply. Um, or you can just edit your INI file directly and add the key if you know the format. Using this method, uh, by the way, rescales all dialogues throughout your system to match the new font size. And what this means is the default dialog unit size, if you're a programmer, you'll know what I mean, is scaled according to the default dialog font. Now, in theory, this is good because it means the dialogues should scale according to the default dialog font. However, if you used a smaller font than the default dialog font when you designed your dialog and you sized your dialog to match that smaller font, you, if the user changes the default font, their dialogues might end up too small, which could lead to text clipping. So you've got to be careful. And I was... Um, I used to be guilty of this in the early days. I was um, brought to my senses by uh, a particular individual who pointed out, and I've come to agree with him, that when you design dialogues as a programmer, you should always design them so that they look okay with the default dialogue font, which is normally 10-point system proportional. An alternative method for changing the dialogue font is provided by Styler2 eStyler, Styler Lite, etc. Uh, and I think Object Desktop back in the day also had a similar feature. Now what this does is it actually subclasses the PM dialog controls to replace the default presentation parameters with a, diff uh, a different font of your choice. Using this method does not rescale the dialogs themselves, <clears throat> which means on the plus side it avoids the issue of carelessly designed dialogs getting clipped. But on the other hand, it also means that you have to choose a font so that it fits properly on all existing dialogues.
Uh, are we okay? Uh, are we connected again? Okay, so I'll continue then. Sorry about that. Pardon? Okay, I'll keep going then. So anyway, um, I discovered a trick that uh, can help you, um, and it can help with the work workplace. Additional sizes to the built-in work sans font. Uh, I added basically 10 point and 11 point to the work sans font. And if you install this font, I discovered that if your desktop resolution goes above a certain size, and I'm not sure what the threshold is, then the built-in workplace shell property notebooks will magically switch to 10-point work sans. I don't know if it'll go up to 11-point on even higher resolutions, but I thought this was really interesting. It's actually really handy on my old um, ThinkPad T43, which has a really high resolution screen, but um, not actually a very large one. So uh, getting that 10 point font on the workplace shell notebooks was uh, actually quite, quite nice. Now, unfortunately, this trick doesn't work with notebooks or pages that are added by some new workplace shell classes like X Workplace, because these add-ons have nine point warp sans hard coded as their font. But uh, may maybe that can be addressed by uh, some modifications. Uh, you also can't change to a different font. Uh, but, but this could be a slight help on high resolution screens because frankly none of our eyes are getting any better these days, right? Uh, okay, can I have the next slide please? So, what font formats does OS2 support? First, there are very types of screen fonts, uh, mostly bitmap fonts, which are and, uh, more of that later. Did we just lose the connection again? Mm -hmm, maybe not. So anyway, hopefully, hopefully everybody knows how to install a font on OS2. Uh, you can use the font palette, edit button, and then add, uh, if you're not aware of that. Or you could, uh, another way is to manually copy the font file to its destination and then drag it into the X. Okay, uh, I'm going to back up a little here because apparently the connection wasn't working properly. Um, so 
Uh, these are the font formats that OS2 supports, basically. And the reason I marked OpenType CFF in italics is because it's not supported out of the box, but I'll discuss that a bit more later. So hopefully you all know how to install a font. Um, you can use the font palette. You can use the X Workplace font folder. Uh, there are some other programs on, uh, on hubs uh, and so on, which can also install fonts. And recently, <clears throat> there have been a number of warp in font packages, which take care of the installation for you, most of which I uploaded. Next slide, please. Now, I'll take a closer look at each of these formats. And I'll try to be quick, because we're a little um, running a little behind. So screen fonts are called that because they're only for use on screen. Uh, OS2 supports several formats of this type, all of which are OS2 only. They won't work on other platforms. And since no printer understands these formats, they can't be printed unless you embed them into an image first, of course. Uh, this also means that these screen fonts are not supported by the cross-platform FreeType library and therefore cannot be used by any application which depends on FreeType for font support. This means Firefox and other Mozilla apps, OpenOffice, or anything based on Qt4. Now, the basic type of screen font is the Presentation Manager bitmap font format. Warp Sans, System Proportional, System VIO, System Monospaced, etc. Now, being bitmaps, these fonts are optimized for clear, crisp display on screen at relatively low resolutions. Uh, however, they, they cannot be transformed, so they can't be rotated, they can't be freely scaled, etc. Uh, these fonts do support multiple languages to a point, uh, but they do that through an encoding that only supports around a thousand characters total in certain specific languages. If you need to define a font with more characters than that, you would need a different format. Because of this, IBM introduced, around the mid-1990s, a new font format called the Combined Font. These fonts have the extension CMB or ABR. Now, what a combined font is, is basically a special container that combines several physically separate fonts into one virtual font with its own name and properties. This is most commonly used on DBCS versions of OS2 to support bitmap fonts with tens of thousands of Chinese characters. However, this font can also be used to create font aliases. Basically, if you create a combined font with only one member, you've just created an alias for that member. And the most recent versions of OS2 include one such font, Times New Roman MT30, which is actually, if you look at it, it's, a, it's not a true type font. It is a CMB file, which is simply an alias for Times New Roman WTJ, a different font. Now, this font format is documented in some very obscure IBM documents, but not very well. And there are also no tools for creating these fonts currently available, although I did actually start to try writing one once upon a time. I kind of stalled, but the source is on my GitHub page. Now, finally, moving into the realm of pure trivia, we have what's called the Unifont format, which is also described in the same obscure IBM documents. Now, this format, this type of font is so rare that I'm not entirely sure if any actually exist. However, there is a driver for them. It's included in an OS2, pmunif.dll. So there may be some out there somewhere, perhaps for some special IBM customers. Uh, now, the Unifont format is basically an extended bitmap font format, which supports native Unicode encoding. And that's really about all I can tell you about it. OK, next slide, please. OK, most cross-platform fonts use a vector-based format, and these are sometimes called outline fonts. PostScript Type 1 is the oldest format in common use. It was developed in the 1980s by Adobe. Each, font, each Type 1 font consists of multiple files. Uh, the actual glyph data is contained in a PFB file. Data about character names and measurements is contained in a metrics file. This comes in any of several possible formats, depending on the OS. Under Windows, it's a binary file with the extension PFM. Under Unix, it's an ASCII file with the extension AFM. And under OS2, it's a binary file with the extension OFM. To install a Type 1 font, you need either the OFM file or the AFM file, plus the PFB file. 
If you install using an AFM file, OS2 will automatically convert it into an OFM file for you. In other words, to install a Type 1 font, you need the PFB file and either an AFM or OFM file. Got that? There'll be a test. Because Type 1 is a native PostScript format, PostScript printers support them natively. The standard OS2 PScript driver, as I mentioned, can embed them into a print job. So traditionally, Type 1 fonts have been the best choice for printing under OS2 and many other platforms. Have traditionally been. This isn't quite true anymore. Now, the problem with this format is it doesn't support Unicode encoding, and it can only contain up to a few hundred characters. So if you want to support Latin and Cyrillic and Greek and Hebrew and Thai and everything, uh, sorry, you're out of luck. Um, well, you might be able to get those, but you wouldn't be able to get Japanese and Chinese as well, and you probably wouldn't be able to get any of a dozen or so other languages that people might need. So, um, Also, Type 1 fonts don't have highly sophisticated hinting, which means they may not look great on screen, although they'll look beautiful when printed. Now, Type 1 fonts were the standard for high-quality desktop publishing until about 10 or 15 years ago, and most professional fonts were, up to that point, distributed in this format. Nowadays, however, OpenType has largely replaced it. Next slide, please. To compete with Adobe, who had the monopoly on fonts with their Type 1 format, Apple and Microsoft decided to get together and jointly develop the TrueType format around the early 1990s. The TrueType specification was made publicly available, and Apple and Microsoft really pushed the format aggressively. So, a lot of people started making TrueType fonts. Unfortunately, this meant that a lot of cheap and poorly designed TrueType fonts flooded the market, which caused TrueType to get something of a bad reputation amongst graphics professionals. However, the TrueType format is in no way inferior to Type 1. In fact, in many ways, it's more sophisticated and powerful. TrueType fonts support multiple encodings, including Unicode, and up to tens of thousands of characters in a single font. TrueType also supports much more finely tuned hinting for optimal display on screen. Now, OS2 introduced TrueType support in Warp 4. It was then added to Warp 3 in a late fix pack, I think 35 or something. Unfortunately, the early versions of OS2's TrueType driver were not very high quality, which led to fonts looking kind of ugly. Later versions improved this quite a bit, but it's still not perfect. Nowadays, however, TrueType is largely obsolete, and it isn't used much anymore. And that sounds like a very strange thing for me to say, because obviously there are TTF fonts everywhere. What I actually mean is that the original TrueType format has been superseded by what's called the TrueType Open format, which is more commonly called OpenType TT. These fonts are also TTF files, and they are actually backwards compatible with the original TrueType format. So it's kind of splitting hairs. But I just thought I'd throw that out. Next slide, please. OK, finally, we have OpenType. The OpenType font format was jointly developed by Adobe and Microsoft. You keep track of these alliances. You know. um, it's actually an extension of the TrueType format, which adds many new features. Uh, first of all, glyph data can be stored in either TrueType or PostScript format. This makes it easy to convert Type 1 fonts into OpenType without any loss of data. Second, and more importantly, OpenType fonts can include advanced typographic features. This includes things like being able to choose proportional or tabular numbers, ligatures, scriptable and content-sensitive glyph substitution, alternate characters, historical variants, and much more. OK, so there are two main types of OpenType font. OpenType TT, which contain TrueType glyph data, and OpenType CFF, which contain PostScript glyph data. OpenType TT fonts, which have the extension TTF, or occasionally TTC, are basically TrueType fonts with some extra tables, and they should work fine on OS2. OpenType CFF fonts, which are becoming more and more common, they have the extension OTF, and they have not been supported on OS2 until recently. Now, most commercial fonts or at least the high-quality ones used in professional publishing, use the OpenType CFF, or OTF, format. Next slide, please. 
Uh, you will probably hear references to free type. I've mentioned it a few times. Uh, this is a mature and high quality open source library for rendering fonts, i.e. loading glyphs from a font file and drawing them on the screen. FreeType has been ported to OS2 and is used by various projects. By itself, it's important to remember that FreeType is a programming library for developers. You can't use it directly except through software that incorporates it. Uh, FreeType... Um, actually, I'll skip past that next point because we're running short on time. Next slide, please. Um, FreeType 2, IFI, Intelligent Font Interface. This was one of the earliest projects to use FreeType on OS2. And what this is, is a replacement module for Presentation Manager's default TrueType font driver. The one I said wasn't very good. In spite of the similar name, FreeType 2 is not the same thing as FreeType. It uses FreeType for drawing characters, but it implements a lot of complicated functionality of its own. Uh, the original uh, version of FreeType, uh, written by Mikal, was uh, written more than 15 years ago, and it used version 1 of the FreeType library. It's passed through the hands of several developers since then, and seems to have ended up with yours truly. Uh, version 1.3 is the latest release of this code base. It's on my website, with the URL on the slide. Next slide, please. Now, one of my pet projects. A few years back, I decided to try writing a new version of FreeType 2, which uses version 2 of the FreeType library. The main advantage of this is that it allows OTF fonts to be supported on OS2. Now, because they use the system font drivers to get the names of installed fonts on the system, this even allows applications like Firefox, OpenOffice, and Qt4 to use OTF fonts as well, even though they use their own separate versions of FreeType to actually render them. So it's a big advantage being able to use OTF fonts through this driver. Now, you can download pre-release beta versions of FreeType 2 version 2 from my GitHub page, the link's on the slide. Unfortunately, I haven't made an official release yet because it still has some annoying bugs in it which I have not been able to fix. And they're listed on the slide if you're interested. Next slide, please. Uh, Intertech Font Engine. Here's another ghost that still haunts us. <clears throat> Intertech Font Engine was an old effort to support anti-alias text uh, in OS2, and it did this by replacing some key pieces of Presentation Manager's graphics engine. It used to be needed if you wanted anti-alias high-quality text in old versions of Mozilla. However, it's been obsolete for that purpose for many years now. Mozilla apps now use Cairo and FreeType directly, and they don't need the Intertech Font Engine anymore. In fact, it can cause serious problems if you use the Inotech font engine with modern Mozilla apps. If you ever used it in the past, make certain that it is no longer configured to operate on Firefox, Thunderbird, or SeaMonkey. You can do this by editing the registry according to the documentation from Inotech, or else you can use the mozinst package from Hobbs, which includes a script for cleaning the, registries, uh, the entries out of the registry. That said, the Intertech font engine is still required, as far as I know, by OpenOffice, for now. This doesn't require anything to be in your registry as far as uh, application settings are concerned, because OpenOffice calls the font engine routines directly. Next slide, please. OK, just to wrap up, I'll list a few useful free fonts that you can get. This list doesn't include some of the obvious well-known ones, like the Microsoft Core fonts, Deja Vu, or my own font designs. Um, a lot of these fonts are available on Hobbs with automated installers. I've marked those with asterisks. Uh, and others are available through links in the slides. Uh, and a quick note about the second item from the bottom, the Microsoft ClearType collection. This is a, a really good, really useful collection of fonts. Uh, and they are actually standard on both Windows and Apple Mac OS X. There is no link here, but if you search on Hobbs, you can find an automated installer that downloads these fonts from Microsoft's own servers and installs them. So it should be legal. There is something in the license about requiring that you have Microsoft PowerPoint Viewer installed as well. So it might be a bit iffy if you, unless you have a Windows partition on your computer as well, but 
I, it's it's a bit complicated. But anyway, I, I disclaim responsibility. You can, if you're willing to understand the legalese, by all means, you can find these fonts on Hob, the font installer on Hobbs, and I do recommend them uh, if you can uh, figure out whether you can use them. So next slide. Oh, that's all. Thank you for listening, and if we have time, I guess uh, I can take questions. I'm, I'm just waiting to see if there's somebody that has a question, but it seems everybody is awfully quiet here. Satisfied. Satisfied. Yeah, did I send him to sleep? <laughs> no, no, no. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Well, that just goes to show how much goes into keeping fonts and printers moving on OS2. Um, Alex, I think there are no questions then. So thank you from Japan for, because I think at your side, what time is it now, 10? Uh, yeah, just after 10. Okay, so, well, you have a good night's sleep and uh, uh, thanks for, uh, for dialing in from the other side of the world. <laughs> uh,